Good morning, everyone, and welcome to ODI. My name is Marta Foresti. I'm one of the managing directors here at ODI, and I, as some of you know, I've been sort of leading our work on migration and development over the last um, few years. Um, it is a real pleasure to welcome to ODI today Louise Arbour, who is the United Nations Secretary General Special Representative on International Migration. We're just joking about you know, how, how many acronyms you can you know, work out with these letters, and UNSRRG, but I'm going to try to avoid that. I've learned that lesson. Um, uh, welcome to all of you to our Global Challenges event. We're here in the room today. This is the event ODI, in the event series at ODI. Um, where we discuss and tackle some of the most critical issues facing the world and when we invite leaders like Louise uh, to join us, to provoke us all with uh, keynote speeches that we then uh, use as a base to have uh, a, a conversation with all of you in the room, but also with our online audiences. I think we have about 100 people following this event online, and let me encourage all of them to um, pose questions to Louise and the panel um, later when we begin um, the, broader, um, the broader conversation. Um, this is uh, obviously a public event um, on the record, so please do tweet, um, do help us spread the words. We just had a discussion uh, half an hour ago about how important it, it is uh, on these issues of, uh, on global migration. We all make an effort to talk to, to everybody and to improve the conversation around the world and to those who genuinely want to understand better. Um, what can be done around uh, migration. Um, use the hashtag global challenges, but also hashtag for migration, which is widely used in the context of the global compact and ODI, um, the ODI dev Twitter handle. We'll also be tweeting live from the room um, as we proceed. So um, I probably don't need to tell you that migration continues to be at the top of the global political agenda, as well as to be a very hot topic in a number of countries um, uh, in, in Europe um, in particular. Um, the, as in, in 2016, uh, member states, states from around the world came together during the General Assembly of the UN in New York, and they agreed the New York uh, Declaration on Refugees and Migrants. And as part of that declaration, and Apologies to going to a little bit of a UN um, speech. Um, the decision was made, the commitment was made to develop a new global compact on migration, as well as one on, uh, on refugees. So we're going to focus particularly on the one on migration today. Uh, we're going to hear about from Louise on um, where we are with the development of that global compact. Um, but let me offer, to begin with, some um, like personal reflection on it. Is that I, this is not the first time that I witness um, some of these global events and UN processes. And obviously, they, you know, we are all, um, you know, they all have um, pros and cons. They, have, they present opportunities and challenges. Obviously, global agreement in the space of migration is, uh, is not an easy uh, task. Um, however, I am convinced, I'm persuaded, this is a pretty unique opportunity that we've got, precisely because it's such a complex issue to be handled um, in different parts of the world, to actually generate a genuine discussion and a genuine conversation and a platform for future engagement on an issue uh, as important as as this. I think a lot will depend on what will actually be negotiated and agreed by member states in this, um, in this compact, but a lot more will rest on our collective capacity to the, make the most of this moment, uh, to change the conversation and to have more realistic and pragmatic ways to handle uh, the future of global migration. So in the first hour of today's event, we will have a keynote um, speech by, um, by Louise in a minute, followed by a panel um, discussion, a conversation uh, with, um, with our panel here today. So let me briefly introduce the panel before I hand over um, to Louise, who I'll also briefly introduce. Um, first of all, let me welcome um, from the beautiful city of Rome, um, Emma Bonino, who is the, uh, of course, was a former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Italy, but also she was um, a former EU Commissioner on Humanitarian Affairs, and at the time I was actually working in, in Brussels. And let me also say that for all of us Italian who, with an interest in politics, Emma is a bit of a legend. Um, she's been um, an activist. She has been behind most, some of the most important civic battles in Italy and elsewhere uh, over the years. And I am truly delighted to welcome you virtually uh, 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 to ODI um, from, your, um, home in Ro from your home in Rome. That, 
Anna has a beautiful terrace of beautiful plants um, that uh, <laughs> the FT has been uh, writing about to say how important Emma is for all of us. Um, we then have the Honourable Ratna Omidvar, who is an independent senator of Ontario, appointed by um, Prime Minister Trudeau, um, and, and also the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Migration. And Ratna has been working again as an activist, as a thinker in this space in Canada and elsewhere for many years. So we are delighted to welcome you here and to have the perspectives of somebody that comes from a country that has so much to offer and so much positive messages around issues of migration. The, panel will be chaired um, by Razia Iqbal, who is a presenter of news at, on News Hours on the BBC World Service, and, um, and she will be um, both chairing the discussion with the panel and then have a conversation with all of you and with the um, audience online. And now to Louise. Um, this is when everybody says, oh, Louise Khalid does not need, you know, the, everybody knows who she is, she does not need an introduction. But let me remind you about who Louise is and what she has done. She has served as UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, um, and also she was the Chief Prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and she contributed to bring to justice some well-known war criminals. Um, Louise was appointed by the Secretary General Antonio Guterres as a special representative of international migration. I think about a, is that a year ago now, Louise? A bit? Not quite. Not quite. Uh, he's been around these debates for a long time. And I cannot think of anybody better than Louise to help us marshal us through this challenging but terribly important political process that we are about to engage with. So Louise, without further ado, please welcome to ODI. Thank you. Very much. I'm very happy to be with you today, and uh, I look forward to a really interesting conversation, not only with the panel, but with uh, all of you. I have to say ODI has been very active, has made very uh, important contributions to the, the preparatory process uh, that is just about to wrap up uh, towards the adoption of a global compact on migration, and ODI's intellectual and very policy smart contributions to date really have set a gold standard for contribution by the multi-stakeholders engaged in this process. Um, in addition, I think I have to say Marta herself did a fantastic job as a thematic expert in one of our um, thematic sessions that is part of the formal process and in fact she made such an impression. She's been invited to come and uh, uh, moderate a key session that will be held in uh, Mexico in early December. This will be the stock-taking meeting that will then uh, be a launching pad for the two ambassadors who are the co-facilitators of this process and who will be producing the zero, what's called the zero draft of the Global Compact. So, Marta, thank you very much for this invitation and your work to date. So let me just maybe share with you a few observations that I can extract from the process so far. I actually was appointed last March. I know it seems like an eternity to you. Imagine what it feels to me. And we've had a series of thematic consultations and regional ones. So I'd like to just share with you today just a few ideas that I've been able to extract from the process so far. Um, particularly the regional consultations have brought home to me the variety and the complexities of the ways in which migration issues present themselves on the global scene. From Filipino women migrant workers in Gulf countries to regularization exercises in Morocco, they are a multiplicity of both problems and solutions that are easily obscured when a purely Western-centric point of view dominates the analysis. Even within the West, Emphasis moves from preoccupations with what are called sometimes flows of migrants into Europe to stocks of irregular migrants, for instance, in the United States. And I pause here to comment on the use of language through which we perpetuate very unhelpful stereotypes, if not worse. And in this field, it's quite shocking <clears throat> to see how the use of language in a very invidious way has sometimes really poisoned the public debate. Uh, just this expression, stock and flow, which is, I understand, it's a technical expression used by population experts. And I really do believe that this one is purely innocent. 
but I can't well help be aware that it analogizes migrants to merchandise or stocks, um, livestock, actually. There are many other expressions that I believe are less innocent, but very deliberately invidious, and they do actually aim and sometimes succeed at poisoning public opinion. Illegal rather than irregular migrant, I think now has really been pushed back, but was the dominant uh, expression used until quite recently. Expressions such as hordes, waves, swarms, rather than simply large numbers. Contract workers rather than migrant workers, which very conveniently obscures the vulnerabilities that come from being a foreigner. So this is just a side issue, but I think in this field we need to be very alive of uh, the public discourse being at times entirely uh, hijacked by this kind of vocabulary. So approaching the Global Compact as a truly global issue will be one of its many challenges, but also one of its key opportunities. The challenge will be to be relevant to all without drowning in detailed specificities. And the opportunity will be to rise above the exaggerated importance of issues that are time and place sensitives and to put in place a framework that will, will serve all, all of us well now and in the future. So a second observation on my part is how the approach to migration through the Global Compact so far has recentered the conversation, importantly so, around development issues, rather than around almost exclusively security concerns, where it occupied, I believe, a somewhat exaggerated space, at least in many corners of Western public opinion, certainly until recently and maybe still to date. So development is now, I think, the proper anchor for uh, moving forward on this issue. And finally, before I return to some of these development-related considerations, and in line with my previous comments about the choice of vocabulary, I believe that the last year or so has contributed to the beginning, the beginning of a change of narrative. In this field, as in many others, reality is much, much better than perception. And I think this reality has to take hold if we're going to succeed in the global compact and changing the narrative or at least having a more balanced narrative is going to be very much part of the exercise. And this reality, I think, is gaining ground. Outside informed circles such as this one, knowledge about the impact of remittances, for instance, is often very limited. And yet when I, like I'm sure many of you, have opportunity to discuss this issue with political decision makers, for instance, I found that some were not particularly well informed about the importance of many aspects of migrations, particularly this one. For instance, did they know that $420 billion in remittances that migrants make to developing countries in 2016 represented some 15% of their earnings and about three times the total amount of official development aid. Often, they didn't know that. Well, then surely they knew that remittances often amount to more than 20% of GDP in some countries. Really, they said? Had they considered that uh, what this impact would be if we could actually reduce the cost of transfer of these remittances from the current average of about 7.5% to 3%, as we've already committed to do? No idea. And they often had no that idea that we actually know how we could do that, that is, reduce the cost of transfer of money, uh, and that actually there's a lot that they could do themselves as political decision makers. Increase competition amongst money transfer providers and reduce the oversight requirements, which as part of money laundering and financing of terrorism preoccupations, have actually taken the banks out of a business that is too cumbersome to be lucrative. This is something that political decision makers, you would have thought, should be right on top of. And did they know, while we're at it, that if we could improve financial awareness 
on the parts of the recipients of these individually modest sums of money, the impact on developing countries would be even greater. If they didn't know everything I've mentioned up to now, there's a good chance they didn't know that part either. But I believe that this is now starting to be good news because this reality, amongst others, brings the conversation about migration to a much, much better place. And the more we talk about these issues, this reality, the more I think we have a chance um, of getting policy uh, uh, choices to be made, not on the basis of mythology and perception, but on reality. And in making sound policy, the foundations have to be facts, not myths, not stereotype, not perception, but reality. So let me turn briefly to the subject of development more broadly. The relationship between migration and development is at once obvious and deceptive. We have an immensely useful starting point, I believe, as migration is not only explicitly recognized as part of the Sustainable Development Goals, the big United Nations development agenda, but it is actually recognized as a tool to achieve maybe, from my point of view, the most surprisingly universally accepted development objective, that is, to reduce inequalities within and between countries, that is, SDG number 10. So here is the link between migration and development. We will facilitate safe, orderly, and regular migration as a way of reducing inequalities within and between countries. That's the framework. And that much is already very clearly stated. What is not always so clearly stated, but is often implied in many uh, policy discussions about migration, is that development is good because it will reduce migration. So you might ask, well, which, which one is it? I would suggest the following. Improved, inclusive development may, in time, change the configuration of migratory patterns. As people are lifted out of poverty, their life choices will improve, including their choice whether to migrate, either to improve their skills or to see greater economic opportunities abroad. Their departure then opens work opportunities for others in their country of origin, thereby accelerating alongside with increased financial and other often intangible transfers of benefit, the whole development potential. And as long as their migration takes place in a well-regulated environment, it also benefits countries of destination thereby contributing to their own development. I should point out that in developed countries, development is usually called prosperity. <laughs> Further development progress, therefore, offers more opportunities at home and may, may, in time, reduce the impetus to leave. It may also serve as an incentive to return for the many who will by then have lived and worked abroad and who may see opportunities to transfer their skills back home. This may also be the case for some who may wish to return in retirement, particularly if they can carry with them their accrued benefits, such as pension or medical insurance, all benefits that they will have earned abroad. So it can go either way, depending on a wi wide range of contextual factors. Development may increase or it may reduce migration at any given point in any given country. What matters is that migration be managed as a way of maximizing its development and other positive economic impacts amongst other objectives, some objectives being more personal to migrants than others. So in order to do so, we must be true to the mantra, migration by choice, not by necessity. But we must be also very clear about what that has to mean. Reduce necessity, increase choices. We should not obscure the reality of what we really mean when we say everyone has the fundamental right to leave their country, because it's also clear that nobody has any fundamental right to go anywhere else. These have to be supported by policy choices. Of course, there's much more behind the pressing need for a global compact on migration than migration's undoubted development potential. 
it will have to deal with the challenge of so-called mixed flows. We begin to anticipate more keenly some of the likely impacts of climate change, acknowledge the need for greater efforts to uphold labor standards, and recognize that in managing more effectively the integration of long-term migrants in host communities, the needs of those communities too must be addressed. And I think on this, we have to be very conscious that migrants uh, often settle in parts of our communities uh, where people are often almost as marginalized as the migrants themselves for different reasons. And I think uh, policies of inclusions have to be very attentive to their well-being as well. But even as we as strip down to a development question, the role migration plays is one that is unquestionably a positive one. I hope that these brief introductory remarks to our conversation today will have convinced you, assuming you needed convincing, that the need for a global compact for international migration on human mobility is self-evident and long overdue. A successful compact has the potential to have a meaningful impact on the lives of millions of migrants, millions of others who live in their new and their old communities. The compact itself will be the result of many months of governmental negotiations that will start, as I said, early next year, based on the zero draft, which will be presented at the end of January. It should be agreed by July next year and will be formally adopted at an intergovernmental conference in December 2018. So the months ahead provide us with a unique opportunity to change the narrative further from perception to reality, mobilizing open-minded citizens everywhere towards harnessing the benefits of human mobility for the greater good. I hope to see all of you very engaged in that process, and I look forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Louise, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'd like to add uh, my welcome to, um, to all of you. Um, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Before we open it up to the panel, Louise, I just want to throw a couple of questions to you. It, the, the heart of what you were talking about, the, the relationship between migration and, and development, several times in that address you talked about it being the, the way in which it would manifest itself in time over a period of time. And I wonder if, if, if you could just say a little bit about the very real fact that politics very often gets in the way of this in every single country, that mm. in most democratic countries, politicians tend to think very much in the short term. And I wonder how encouraged you have been in the initial conversations that you've had that, that policymakers and politicians are willing to think in the long term. Well, I think it's it's an easy enough uh, approach for for policy analysts and policy makers. The real challenge is for political decision makers, who I think always put as part of their ultimate position uh, electoral considerations, and I understand that. I I understand uh, very often the call for. Uh, compromise so as not to jeopardize what they believe is the necessity for them to be re-elected to do better in the longer term. On this kind of issue, I think it is, when I talked about changing the narrative, I think it's critical, particularly in the course of this coming year as we talk about the Global Compact, at least to have public conversations that will make it easier for political decision makers to do things that are hard in the short term but are critically important in the medium and longer term. And if we start to inject demographic projections, for instance, labor market needs in many, many parts of the world, not to, well, on demogra the demographics, I mean, we, their projections for growth uh, in the different parts of the world speaks for itself. There's nothing that developed countries can do really in the short, medium, frankly, successfully in the long term to change their um, fertility and mortality rates. The only thing that will ensure their continued economic growth is migration and my progressive migration policies welcoming uh, people who will fill uh, gaps in the labor force. This is not, these are not factors that play out in short electoral cycles. So, 
But if this conversation is well anchored in public, in informed public opinion um, uh, uh, venues, it will make it easier, I think, for uh, political decision makers, because that's what we're talking about now. Policy analysts have to inform that, and public opinion has to be mobilized to support the longer-term agenda. And the longer-term agenda, there's only one message there. Not only migration is here to stay, in absolute numbers, it's here to grow, even if the proportions of human population on the move remain the same, because there's just going to be more people on Earth. And it has to be in everybody's interest that human mobility be better managed than it is today. And, and in the context of the, the short-term uh, electoral concerns that individual politicians in individual countries might have, that there is the issue which you you said it was a digression and it was a side issue, but the semantics and the language surrounding this debate are clearly critical in the context of the politics as well. If you if you have politicians whose whose sole purpose in trying to get elected the next time is to tap into a rhetoric and use of language that is potentially corrosive and damaging to public debate, how do you how do you challenge that? Well, I think first of all, you expose it for what it is. Uh, you say that the expression, for instance, just the shift we've seen already, as I said, from illegal migrant to irregular, or in some cases, undocumented migrants. I think you, when you see the term, there, at every opportunity, we have to push back and, ex and explain how, I mean, the analogy I've often used is, if uh, somebody doesn't fill their income tax report in time, we don't say this is an illegal taxpayer. Right? We, we have to bring home the fact that, and also that irregularity or illegality comes in multiple forms. By choosing the expression that is the most pejorative, we validate a perception, for instance, that irregular migrants are all people who use smugglers and crash borders and so on, when in fact, and again, I, I don't have numbers, but I, I'm prepared to guess that overall, most people in irregular situations have actually entered a country perfectly lawfully, but then have extended the term of their stay beyond what, per, what was permitted in their visa, for instance. So it obscures a reality. So we have to be alive to this invidious use of ter terminology and push back. Ratna, let me turn to you. And, and uh, Louise was talking a, a, a lot about the way in which policy makers can inform politicians and, and you've just come back from discussing migration policy at the World Economic Forum. What do you think should be the role of the private sector when it comes to concerns of global migration? Thank you and thank you Marta for having me here. Uh, because you mentioned the World Economic Forum and Dubai, uh, I want to tell you that nowhere else in the world uh, that I have been, and I travel a lot, have I seen close up and personal the very close relationship between the prosperity of a nation, which is Dubai, and migration. Migration is everywhere in this city-state. Um, and I'm not a proponent for their migration system. It creates its own inequalities. Um, and its own abuses, but it's very clear to me when I when I look at that uh, place, which is creating a new financial center, a new banking center, a new vacation spot for people who don't feel welcome anymore here, but they feel perfectly welcome there. It seems to me that migration is at the heart of business development, job creation, and e economic prosperity. Um, so the question is not why we should bring business into the conversation, but how. And here there are a couple of challenges, I believe, around the global compact for migration and just generally around issues of migration. There's a certain amount of toxicity involved because one, the, one tends to focus on the smaller numbers of irregularities as opposed to, you know, the large flows of regular migration, people who come in, you know, with visas, with permission, who's, who become citizens or not, as the question uh, may be. Um, business tends to stay away, 
I believe, uh, from conversations where there are toxic issues of, of public policy. And if, it, if they want to participate at all, it will not be in forum like for our like these. It will be behind closed doors. So I, I've, I've worked a lot with business in Canada, and I am impressed with how much you can do with business behind closed doors. I'd also like to say that <clears throat> it's a mistake to talk to business from the point of view of corporate social responsibility. The minute you bring that cadre of, uh, of business to the table to talk about migration, you've already lost the game. You need to talk to people in the C-suite, not in the CSR uh, um, realm, because it, it somehow uh, uh, brings it down to a charitable impulse, as opposed to the real impulse, which is business imperative. Imperatives. So I've, you have to persuade them about the profit yeah, you have to margin. Per, you have to persuade them, and you have to work with them. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had some significant success in Canada at first in persuading big corporations to hire immigrants with credentials which they didn't quite get. But where I've had greater success is in changing their hiring practices, in helping them change how they hire, uh, which is the sound of both hands clapping because mm -hmm. I come from a country where, you know, we have a lot of uh, immigration. We put a lot of e effort into integrating immigrants. Mm -hmm. I think we need to put as much effort into changing whole society as well. Mm -hmm. So when you try and do that, it works a little better. I'm concerned, though, about uh, one factor, which is um, by bringing business uh, to the table, as I hope the Global Compact will, uh, and there are ambassadors, there are champions, a few of them, Facebook, Giovanni, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have a business leader in Canada who has called out uh, to our government to take our population of 35 million to 100 million by the turn of the century. And the only way we can do it is through migration. So there are a, a few people. I am concerned that when you bring business to the table, business must benefit but so must the migrant. And I'm, I, I'd be a little nervous and concerned about that. And as I think about business uh, and who is at the table or not at the table, I think it's worthwhile noting that we must have universities and colleges at the table as significant stakeholders. They are significant importers and exporters of people and knowledge and students and professors and the pathways of regular migration or immigration, whatever you may choose to call it, to these institutions is fraught uh, with challenges, delays, made more so now uh, by what is happening uh, in parts of the world, which uh, I will be political enough not to name. Uh, so I, I, I think it is important uh, to have business at the table in the right conditions, with the right people, but with the right intent. Okay, uh, Emma Bonino, let's uh, let's turn to you in in Rome. Um, clearly, we saw in 2015 the the crisis hitting the shores of of Europe. I, I wonder to what extent you think that a global compact will help a more comprehensive European response. There was, there was clearly division as to how Europe could respond collectively back in 2015. And Italy has, has uh, taken the, the, the real brunt of, of dealing with migration in large numbers. What, what do you think a global compact would, would do in the context of, say, the European Union? I think it's important, first of all, because at this point, when a global compact will be approved, um, we, the activists in some member states, uh, will feel less alone. Uh, and we, feel, uh, we will feel more supported uh, by the international community than we are now, in which, out of perception again, and I will be back to this point, which is very important, at least in my country, um, through the media, normally, uh, we are depicted as a sort of a visionaries or, I don't know, uh, somebody living on the moon when there is a, a reality and the reality is elections. 
for instance, or, or the fear uh, of so-called the fear of the of the population. Um, so for us, it's very important both in the substance and in the message that it will spread. And we will feel stronger and supported, not only by our ideals or whatever you want to call it, um, but in our policy that we are practically pushing. And, if, uh, and this is so important because over and over again, when I campaign in Italy, even if the campaign, I was a, a foreigner, has been very successful because without any institutional support except the mayors, a lot of mayors supported this campaign. We managed to collect 100,000 legal signatures on a proposal uh, of uh, law. But again, the, when you go out and talking to people to collect signature, which is very different from pushing a click and the digital signature, you have to go out with a table and people come to sign or you engage with them, uh, the most important obstacle is uh, perception and lies. For instance, in my country, we have 8% of immigrants, uh, uh, regular, plus, which makes five to six million out of a, of a country out of 60 million. Plus, we have the real problem, which is 500,000 irregular migrants or non-documented migrants, but we call them clandestine. And we have even invented a crime, a crime of clandestinity. Nobody knows what it is, but uh, reality. But that is the point. And these clandestine, which are simply non-documented, as Louise said, many of them were totally regular before the visa expired and they were not able to renew the visa, for instance, for several reasons, uh, are 500,000, 600,000. Of course, these people, which are irregular, uh, don't have a proper uh, job. Uh, they, they are in the black labor market with all the, the pressure that that means for them, or just to survive, do you, the, many of them uh, uh, go to micro criminalities. Uh, the big criminality is run by Italian, by the way. Um, no, that, that's, uh, let's be clear. Um, uh, but they are used as uh, workers of this uh, network um, or, or other kind of uh, prostitution, for instance, which is not prostitution. Uh, I would not shy to call it slavery because this lady coming from Nigeria, they are robbed of documents, they have nothing, they have to pay back what the family anticipated to the smuggler. So basically, they, it's a sort of slavery, it's not a sort of uh, prostitution. So perception is the most important thing. When you say to people, how many uh, foreigners we have in Italy? The, the, the result is well from 30 to 40 percent. Yeah, it's 8 percent. Uh, and so uh, and you go on and on on uh, any sort of stereotyping. Typically, they steal our job, which is definitely not true. We are sector of economy in Italy, such as agriculture, construction, um, aid, uh, home aid. Uh, and care for for old people or children who uh, no Italian wants to do anymore. And without migrants uh, and working migrants, this sector of the economy will simply close. This is not because I say it, but the, the final research of the business community and other official research center proves exactly that. Italy, as an, like Spain, Portugal, Germany, Bulgaria, as an extraordinary ordinary demographic decline. Uh, and, and on top of that, rightly so, 100,000 Italians left Italy uh, uh, the past year for better job or for living abroad or for whatever it is. So 
the calculation for us is that just to keep the balance in the working force, uh, we would need 160,000 new people per year in the next 10 years, right? So this is the reality. But the perception is different. Recently, there has been a wave of rape automatically the rape was done by migrants, automatically. Now, recently, uh, it has been exposed to, to the world that violence or rape uh, on women has a, quite a white face. Hmm? Uh, many outstanding uh, white, uh, uh, very uh, well-known people. So maybe this stereotype of mig rapist migrants uh, will uh, uh, will uh, um, reduce um, uh, uh, at least in this moment. So, but you go on and on, and so why we are reacting, uh, proposing, proposing, uh, starting with Louise's point that uh, that migration is here to stay, and is even here to to grow. Uh, and well-ordered migration can be an asset for the economy, and it is already. In Italy, 8% of the foreigners uh, produce 9% of the GDP. They are net contributors to the welfare system because most of them uh, go back to their own country without transferring, because it's forbidden for the moment any kind of the investment they have done to the, uh, to the, well, to the welfare state uh, when legally working in Italy. Finally, uh, I would just want to add something that Luis pointed out. Um, now it's very popular in Italy, let's help them, uh, chez eux, um, comment tu dis? Let's uh, help them in Africa. Hmm? Uh, which is very good, and you talk to somebody who made such a campaign early in the 80s, simply believing that if we were not interested in Africa, sooner or later Africa will be interested in Europe, for evident reason. The demographic explosion is enormous, as uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, Sahel, and so on and so forth. And so there is no quick fix development policy that can solve this issue next year. So even if we are prepared to do a better development assistant, uh, et cetera, et cetera, it will take at least few generations. And it will be it will the, the responsibility of good governance. Nigeria is not a poor country uh, at all. It's a country which is badly managed, politically speaking. So the, the question of poverty is the uh, result of a, bad, of a bad policy. Only a final white last point on demography. I strongly believe that there is no miracle solution, but that investing and in empowering women is one of the way to go forward to reduce, let's say, so um, there is a study by Oxe that was published last year uh, uh, that simply says that reducing um, uh, the, the child marriage and promoting girls staying in school and getting married at 20, et cetera, will reduce the population uh, uh, by 10%. Simply because early marriage, if you married a, 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 a girl at 12, of course she will leave school. Of course she will have the chances or the obligation to make more children and so on and so forth. So investing in women in their rights and in their empowerment is not a miracle solution. But not only it is just and fair, but it's also effective. Thank you. Emma, thank you very much. Um, brilliantly uh, out illustrating not just the, the kind of political situation and the social situation in Italy, but also widening it out. Marta, let's, uh, let's get you to help us uh, at least understand the kind of global dynamics that are at play here. How do you think that, that this global compact can make a difference on, on national policies and, and development and, and migration? Um, thank you, Razi, and everybody for um, 
uh, this um, interesting discussion. Let me um, reflect a little bit on what Louise said about the potential of the Global Compact to finally get right the relationship between migration and development and in turn inform national, you know, national policies on global development in, in ways that can be um, sort of conducive to safe and orderly migration. The first thing I would say is that, and is, is a personal reflection, is that the, the, the development community, and, and I mean by that the, the people, the actors, the ideas around this global effort to try to bring actually prosperity and, um, and social and economic development to all, um, has been very slow at, um, and, and has been not particularly effective at uh, engaging with the debate on migration. And in fact, it took, you know, it took the, the 2015 crisis, the so-called crisis in Europe, to realize that there was a problem on our shores and therefore that you know, in, the, you know, in the migration um, field we needed to um, you know, quickly, uh, quickly catch up. And we at ODI have been at the forefront of being, you know, trying to see that coming and trying to engage in an, at an early stage. But there's always been a bit of a mystery to me of why, given those relationships, this, this, this deep interconnection between people moving and, you know, and development outcomes for themselves, for their communities, for their host communities, why as policy analysts and as activists and as NGOs have not, we've not started to engage with that reality um, sooner. And one reason, and, is, and, and I think it's important to recognize it, is because it does put all of us in a slightly, you know, slightly outside the comfort zone of what we understand with global development. And it's something similar, I think, has happened around some of the climate change debates, where a, a fairly traditional, well-established, in many ways criticized, but still very ingrained view of development, which entails that Nigeria is a poor country, that the rich countries of the world need to help through aid, um, sits at odds with this notion that you know, once you help people at home by you know, supporting economic and social development, surely they're going to be happy and stay, whereas guess what, they move. Um, and that was, you know, that was the, for, for a long time, that was a, you know, both a, a re, you know, the, the evidence has been crystal clear about the, the causality of that relationship, and yet it was, I think, a difficult reality for the community, so to speak, to, to deal with because it did put us in a different place around how do we think about the relationship between, between different countries of the world. And it's definitely an area, a dynamic, where a world divided into developed and developing, rich and poor, donor and recipient, really doesn't help to explain you know, the, the, the dynamics that plays. It's fundamentally a phenomenon, a dynamic of mutuality, where people move, they leave a country, they, you know, they transit through a number of countries, they have journeys, they then go to a destination countries that typically then is also a country for movement again, and that brings the dynamic of international development to life in ways that I think in the community we're not always been as good as we could have been to pick up, talk about, and then finally think about how to use wisely the power, the money, the ideas uh, to make a difference. And that led to, I think, a particular problem that we do have now. We do have that problem in Italy, which in Italy, sort in Europe, um, Emma has touched on it, which is that, you know, the political landscape is such, and is, there is an interesting combination of where we are with public discourse and public perceptions about aid and ring fencing aid budgets, which is the traditional mechanisms whereby rich countries sort of give money to poorer countries to develop. Um, being used, you know, yes, for you know, with good intention to mitigate, to address some of the root causes of migration. But that has very quickly turned into, as you said earlier, Vasya, too, into a public debate or you know, a, 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 you know, a political expedient message around let's, you know, let's give them aid um, so that they stay at home. And some of it has gone into, you know, with the discussions being held around kind of using um, migration and sort of border control as conditions for aid. Um, there is the controversial European Trust Fund for Africa that has some elements of that. And I think that is a problem, and we, sh we need, and, and, and it's something that Louise and I have discussed before, and it would be a big challenge for the Global Compact to get that right, because we need to be explicit about not just the fact that, that that's not true, or the fact there is no proof that's the case, that aid doesn't work, but there is a fundamental you know, problem with establishing a, a relationship between countries that I think with migration becomes mutual and, re and reciprocal with money being attached to people, you know, to migration policies, meaning that people are not, um, you know, are not allowed to move uh, or not, you know, particularly not allowed to move our way. They're, you know, perfectly happy to help them move in, in the neighborhood. Um, so that that is um, so that is unfortunately a, a, you know one way of interpreting this this potential relationship, which I think is incredibly positive, 
Um, and one thing to be done, and, and a Global Compact is an incredible opportunity to get this right, is to clarify that people moving has effects as well as costs and, ch and has challenges as well as benefits in relation to a variety of development outcomes, right? Is, you know, if you are serious about achieving universal health coverage for your population in any country of the world, both extending that coverage to migrant populations, but also having a policy that allows health workers from different countries to contribute to that endeavor are part and parcel of what it is you're trying to achieve. And to really articulate the reasoning behind how people moving has effects on different parts of development policies, the prosperity and the well-being of us all, rather than being a, you know, something that is fundamentally attached to a policy that is, you know, is, is um, tailored to people living in, in low-income countries. I mean, on that, I must admit, I am encouraged by what I'm picking up in the process of the Global Compact for Migration, partly because a number of countries are around the table who know that, who have frankly sick and tired of a certain rhetoric around how the world powers work and have a real stake themselves in managing their stock and flows, um, as, as Luis put at the beginning. Think of Mexico, think of Turkey, things of Morocco, where, you know, countries where people come, where people go, that, you know, that really have a, an interest in, in having a policy fit for purpose for their you know, for their own development policies and prosperity. So I am, you know, as much as this debate can be, can look very dominated by the political realities of Europe and the US, I think one big advantage of the UN um, mechanics and the negotiations is that it truly brings, you know, the powers of different parts of the world around the table for what, you know, is likely to be a serious political negotiations. Finally, if there is another mistake that we have made in the development community on this, on this, um, on, on this um, topic and we are working very hard to correct and get right is that we've relied too much on the very clear evidence around the economic benefits of migration. There are, it's, it's fascinating, is an area where most economists in the world agree that there is very clear evidence that migration benefits um, you know, um, populations and countries in terms of growth, in terms of, you know, in terms of income for migrants, in terms of you know, level of um, of prosperity of some of the, of the host communities. And yet, we have found, you know, work we've done at ODI, but increasingly elsewhere, we've talked about lies and perceptions. We found that, you know, drumming in the message that really, really has economic benefits to the people who are fundamentally worried and persuaded, who saw the images of people, those flows and those stocks, you know, coming their way on the screens every night in 2015, it just doesn't cut through. It's not, on, on its, you know, in and of itself, it's not gonna make a difference. There is a, there is a need to, to, to tailor that language. It's, it's, not, you know, it's not done between today and tomorrow. It, it needs to be a sustained engagement. It needs reasoning as much as facts. And critically, those facts need to go beyond the, um, the economic um, benefits and realities and need to take into account the, the costs, and some of those costs, of course, are costs to do with social, you know, with, with social issues, with, you know, you know people, uh, you know, people's uh, perceptions about being uh, threatened. It's, you know, it's all very good to say that, you know, there is no way that migrants are stealing anybody's job in a country like the UK, but if you're experiencing it, the private part of the country is that, you know, you, yourself and your kids are struggling to find a job or you're struggling to get your kids into school and you see, or you, you think you see, um, um, you know, others benefiting from that is something that we need to tackle head on. I, obviously, the, there, is, there are limits of what, how much we can do in that space through issues around development policies. There are big, you know, we need to be careful about, you know, reinforcing it with, as I said, this idea of using aid as a solution, but nevertheless, ex making it explicit, explaining the relationship between people moving and development, social, economic, and cultural outcomes in different sphere is certainly um, an endeavor worth investing in. We're doing our bit of DI, and we're trying to bring a little bit the development community along because, as I said, we've been a bit slow in, in, in engaging. <laughs>